Thank you. Danielle, actually, it's me that is presenting for the beginning. Perfect. So, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Economy event on the topic of shaping the post-corona world, possible responses for society and business. So I'm glad to see that many faces tonight, also some known faces from our network. Uh, we are also on Facebook Live, so welcome to all of you joining us via the, the live stream. Uh, it is nice also to see that so many people are joining from, from, of course, Switzerland, but also other countries. So welcome to everyone uh, to this event. I am Lorraine Descamps, responsible for the Circular Economy Transition Initiative at Impact Hub Zurich. And I am glad to guide you through this event tonight, together with my colleagues, uh, you will have the honor to meet later. And as the title suggests, uh, tonight we want to have a discussion on what responses and measures are needed on different levels in the special time of Corona crisis in order to shape the future, so not only the, the next months, but also the far future, into a more sustainable, just and inclusive one for all. And in order to make this journey together tonight one that is explorative, one of discussion and of inspiration, we have carefully invited special guests, and I am really looking forward to their inputs and points of view from different perspectives. So, uh, Danielle, you can show the slides with our speakers. Uh, thank you for this. So perspectives from research, business, politics, behavioral change, activism, macroeconomics, and uh, we are really glad to have these great international speakers with us tonight. Welcome to you, Nancy Bocken, Adèle Torrance, Otto Sharma, Marie-Claire Graf, and Ion Karaguni. Please give them a virtual applause. I am going to do it like this from my side. You can push the reaction button as you want. Thank you. So why this event? Why now? And what is the concrete aim of such an online gathering uh, like this one tonight? So when we set up this event a few weeks ago, uh, the numbers of new cases in Switzerland uh, were still rising like it is in other countries. And we were seeing investments being made in some sectors, our ind industries, uh, seeing also the harsh reality for lots of entrepreneurs and businesses in our network. And somehow some parts uh, of our world actually collapsing. In parallel, we were also seeing great new initiatives emerging uh, and we realized how much of a turning point this period actually is. So lots of questions arose uh, and especially now in this shaking moment the one of do we want or do we have to go back to business as usual after this crisis. Uh, so for us the answer was clearly no of course not because the way we do business has had a heavy toll on our environment and society. But how should the post-corona world look like then? To give a little bit of background on who is behind this whole thing, uh, so Daniel also there, you can show the slides if you like. Uh, Circular Economy Transition is an initiative that has been founded almost two years ago and that set itself as a goal to transition the economy of Switzerland together with other actors into a more circular and regenerative. So now you might wonder what this means. To say very briefly, a circular economy to us is an economy in which few resources from our planet are extracted and where these are used in a way that they can always be brought back into the natural or the economical system. And this means uh, to already in the design of products and services, introduce notions like modularity, reparability, non-toxicity, but also to rethink the way we use goods. Uh, for example, the famous R's you might know, so reduce, reuse, repair, etc. We also believe a circular economy enables new opportunities for capturing value, also monetary value, uh, for example, through shifting the ownership of the product, um, hashtag sharing economy or product as a service. And one final aspect we believe is crucial for a working circular economy is the mindset. We need to adopt one that values diversity 
uh, and that moves from the current silos thinking, so to say, into a circular and systemic one, so systemic thinking. So our main goal with this transition happening on different level, levels is to shape the economy of tomorrow into a viable, inclusive and ecologically sustainable one, and so to stop uh, living on the back of the planet as we are currently doing it. So you can now imagine uh, why uh, going back to business as usual is not an option for us. I am therefore really, really looking forward to the discussion tonight to see what opportunities actually and challenges uh, this moment now offers to us for this transition. Not to mention, of course, the amazing national team behind this event. So please turn on your cameras if you haven't so everyone can see you. Great. Thank you. Now, what is actually happening tonight? Why did you join us tonight? So after an inspirational input from Mr. Otto Scharmer, so Daniel, you can also show the slide, we will have a panel discussion with our guests and the discussion will open up to you, dear public, so you will be able also to share your questions uh, and receive answers from our panelists. And we will have an Outlook a message afterwards also from Mr. Holger Schmidt um, at the end. So on the next slide, you will find also a few practical information. As mentioned, this event tonight is recorded. So if you should have some technical issues on Zoom, uh, please join the live stream on the Circular Economy Transition page. The link will be posted also in the chat. For those of you who don't know Zoom yet, uh, there is a chat option, but I guess you all <laughs> discovered it. Um, but the questions asked to the speakers won't happen on Zoom, but on a specific uh, tool called Slido. And as we are a broad audience tonight, I can see already almost 200 people here in Zoom uh, and some more on the, on the Facebook live stream. Uh, please, let's use this moment or don't hesitate to spread learnings, visions, inspirations, recommendations via your social media using the hashtag uh, CETransition. We will also be working on a collaborative vision in the break, and we will tell you more about this later. Great. So you can already, you can press the button, uh, Daniel, for the next slide, but you can already connect on sli.do uh, and enter the code hashtag Otto if you want to ask some questions afterwards to our keynote speaker. Thank you. And now, before we kick off the official part of the event, let's have a first glimpse into who is here tonight. Uh, so I'd like you to turn on your cameras for a minute so we have the chance to capture the special moment here all together in this virtual room. Uh, so please turn on your cameras, dear public, in Zoom. Perfect. I see already some cameras turning on. Great. Is our photograph, Victor, ready? Great. So on three, raise your hands or wave to the camera to a better future and give us, of course, your nicest smile. So let's do this picture. Three, two, one. Circular economy. <laughs> okay, I hope this picture is fine. We're gonna have some other tries. Uh, thank you very much already. And now I am really glad to pass on the words to my colleague, Krista Kaufmann, Circular Economy Transition Lead in Lausanne that will introduce us to Mr. Otto Scharmer. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lorraine. So um, it's great to see all of you here tonight for this event. Uh, and I have the honor now to uh, introduce the part for the keynote with um, Otto Scharmer. So as we all know, the Corona crisis and recent events have highlighted deep seated issues in our societies and economies and forced us to take an honest look at our place in all of this. And the realization has started to emerge. Nothing exists in isolation. Everything is connected and dependent. And so the health of our societies and economies rely on the health of our ecosystems. And for our ecosystems to be healthy, our societies and economies need to function in a way which is aligned with our natural systems. Currently, we are not there yet. But to get there, we cannot rely on superficial fixes that only treat the symptoms. We need a profound change, at once at the individual level, but most importantly, on a systemic level. 
This is why we are so honored to welcome our keynote speaker tonight, Otto Scheimer, a recognized systems thinker. He is a senior lecturer at the MIT Management Sloan School and co-founder of the Presencing Institute. He introduced the concept of presencing, learning from the emerging future in his best-selling books, Theory U and Presence. He also co-founded the MIT XU Lab, a platform which has activated a global ecosystem of transformational change involving more than 160,000 users. In March 2020, Otto and his colleagues launched GAIA, which stands for Global Activation of Intention and Action. And this is a free online learning journey geared toward profound civilizational renewal. Otto, we are very much looking forward to hearing more from you now about the renewal and the shift that is needed to shape the post-corona world and to make a more resilient, sustainable, and just future a reality. You can now unmute yourself. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Krista and Lorraine, for uh, uh, having me and uh, for um, making me part of that conversation and for your um, introductory remarks, which already go right to the issue. So uh, maybe to, to kick off the uh, uh, conversation, and I apologize in advance that I will not be able to stay for the full duration of the session. Um, uh, let me share maybe some of my own um, observation and also put the context of the um, circular economy, uh, 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 put the topic of the circular economy uh, into the context of the larger um, transformation of our economy that we are in the midst of and also of our society. <clears throat> so um, if I could, let me just check whether I can actually share screen here. All right, so uh, what you see here is uh, a little bit our current moment, right? A graphical de depiction of, um, of disruption. And um, as you alluded to just a, a moment ago, <clears throat> the COVID-19 disruption uh, has been a disruption that in many ways has made us aware of uh, our level of interdependency, not only as a species, but the interdependency with all living beings and with all ecosystems here on this planet. And in that regard, you can say kind of that disruption has been very much uh, opening our mind, the, the, level of the, the mind on the level of the collective. What's going on right now uh, here in America uh, for the past two weeks, but also around the world, I believe is the next level of disruption, which is um, opening up something even on a deeper level, which is not the level of the mind and how we see things and how we are aware of our interconnectedness, but the level of our hearts, how we feel and how much we feel separate or connected with each other, particularly across the divides of race, of class, and other mechanisms of inclusion. So the perspective that I will be uh, speaking from is this perspective that is um, grounded in uh, systems thinking. And you have seen systems thinking many times, kind of it's depicted here with the iceberg model. It starts with a very simple distinction, which is the distinction between symptoms at the top and root issues beneath. And these four words, um, indicate the evolution of systems thinking over the past 50 years, right? So they're like structural root issues, right? Systems that can be broken or not. Then underneath, there are uh, mental models, paradigms of thought. And um, that is, of course, something we need to address when we talk about real systemic change. And what has happened over the past decade or two is that we have seen 
um, the um, evolution of a fourth level here that's here um, indicated with this word source. Uh, source of what? Source of who we are, source of our creativity, source of our attention and intention. And um, you could also, instead of source, I could have also written consciousness, kind of. So what, what this whole framework uh, is, it's kind of depicting awareness-based systems change or consciousness-based systems change. And it basically can be summarized with three simple simple um, points. You cannot understand a system unless you change it. Famously, Kurt Lewin, the founder of Action Research. <clears throat> Two, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness. That's the one sentence summary of my past 25 years of you know being engaged in a whole variety of change initiatives and efforts and if we just assume that to be true you cannot change the system unless you transform the mindset of the people that that operate in that system so if we assume that to be true for a moment then of course the real question on the table is this one how and that's what the third one is about you cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see and sense itself of course we know that from the interpersonal right so when we individually or in groups go through profound change uh, but do we really do that on the level of systems and i think that's with the corona situation, uh, with the I can't breathe situation, right? And the I can't breathe is something we enact, uh, you know, through systemic racism. We enact through a whole other set of mechanisms of um, structural violence, of direct violence, and also of attentional violence. And that is very much at the core, I think, of uh, the current moment and will shape how we need to rethink and reimagine our economy, the social contract based on which we make arrangements uh, on a collective level, and also how we evolve uh, our democratic um, institutions. <clears throat> so, okay, I said disruption happens. And what is it that we notice? Interestingly, when you go around, you notice that um, there are very different ways of uh, responding to disruptions, but they tend to be the same three uh, you know, types of responses um, that you can see across systems and countries. The first one is this, right? Downloading, you just do more of the same. The second one is turning backward or turning away and closing down. And the third one is turning toward and opening up. So turning away and closing down means it's basically a freeze reaction, right, of the human mind. It's kind of closing mind, heart, will, a.k.a. ignorance, hate, and fear. Turning toward or leaning in, leaning into the emerging future that we don't even know what it is. And I think we perfectly live in a moment like that, requires us to do so to access the open mind, open heart, open will, aka curiosity, compassion, courage. That's, of course, what we try to do here, right? That's why we come together. But we would be blind if we wouldn't notice that in reality, what is happening? This, the opposite. So it's not only, let's be more precise. Let's say both of these things are happening, but there is a difference between this story here that we try to co-enact together and this story here that also happening happens between and around us. And the difference is that in the public conversation, kind of this upper story, the story of absencing, 
you know, gets all the consumes all the oxygen, right? So through social media like Facebook and so forth, there is like um, an amplification mechanism built in that the toxicity of kind of this upper level has been just greatly amplified. So the real question on the table is, what is our job? So what can we do to respond to this situation, not only on the individual level? Obviously, we need to cultivate these capacities individually, curiosity, compassion, courage. But what is it that we can do on a collective, on a systems level? And in my view, the answer to that question is innovations in infrastructures on three different levels, uh, you know, on, on the level of the whole society, which is new learning infrastructures, new democratic infrastructures, and new economic infrastructures. New learning infrastructures, basically whole person, whole system, you know, I, I will I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. New democratic infrastructures, making democracies more direct, more distributed, more dialogic, you know, obviously kind of, you guys in Switzerland are, you know, one of the role models there, kind of that keep this conversation going. But there's a lot of other traction now going on right, with, with uh, citizen assemblies and councils and so forth. And then there is, um, of course, the economic transformation, shifting the economy from an ego system awareness to an ecosystem awareness, by which we mean an awareness that is focusing on the well being of all. So I want to. Uh, talk a little bit about this kind of the third topic here so in my view let me just stop uh, step back here for a second these are the 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 period of disruption we go into and the task that we have to reimagine and reshape not only our economy but also our civilization that is so evident today requires us you know to do many things but among them are these three transformations right the transformation of our economy the advancement of our democratic participatory democratic structures new governance and the reimagine and reshaping of our learning infrastructures so i want to that's basically uh, the, the bigger picture, how I see it. So I, I now I'm going to uh, outline real quick seven acupuncture points here on the new economic infrastructures, most of which will be quite familiar to you. So I'm, I'm just kind of reminding you and reminding us, you know, what's already there so that we connect the dots. And then I will end with just a brief remark on the new learning infrastructures. Acupuncture point number one, nature. From linear to circular economy, um, so an example is, of course, the, uh, the, the shift from the industrial to regenerative agriculture. Um, so project, uh, drawdown, uh, familiar to probably many of you, the top 80 interventions that would reverse global warming, right? The top 20 ranked according to impact, uh, uh, according to impact of the top 20, so that 20 highest impact interventions, 12 of them relate to regenerative agriculture and land use. So it's by far the most under attended to leverage points to combating climate change. And uh, one of many examples for the bigger topic you talk about today in, in this session, kind of the rethinking and reshaping of the economy from linear to circular. And um, that's um, obviously kind of the, the main focus um, for, uh, for today and kind of uh, for uh, dealing with um, uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity. Number two, that is, you know, so now the other six points I talk about are the larger context here because there's, uh, it's not just that. There is the larger transformation of the economy includes other dimensions. So when we talk about labor, there is really a shift from jobs to entrepreneurship. You all know this number, like the next 20, 30 years, we'll have 40, 50 percent of jobs automated. Right. And um, so, again, Switzerland right, was the first country who brought this conversation that is more and more kind of, uh, you know, uh, becoming mainstream. So you pioneered that. I don't know. That must have been seven, eight years. I forgot. 
ago when you had your referendum on that. And the deeper uh, challenge here, the deeper proposition is this, decoupling from income and work. In order to allow for our work to re-relate and to be stronger related to our mission, to our sense of purpose, to our heart, kind of our, you know, what we really want to bring to the world rather than just survival uh, anxiety. Number two. Number three. Finance, from extractive to regenerative finance. Uh, in other words, from externality, blind ways of organizing finance. Uh, think uh, Wall Street, right? To externality aware. Um, that is kind of, you know, making us aware of the larger contextual, but also systemic impact of uh, our um, financial and economic uh, activities. So, um, there's like different numbers, but uh, basically kind of that's the, um, uh, that is the larger topic here. The Global Alliance for Banking on Values is one of the examples here, the driving forces where you already have uh, financial institutions right now, it's 50 of them, kind of who really make an intentional effort into that uh, direction. Number four, technology. From surveillance capitalism, to self-governance, or to put that a different way, from human creativity disabling to human creativity enabling technologies. I think one of the most um, important books of the last um, decade is this one, Shoshana Zuboff, Surveillance Capitalism. She talks about epistemic inequality and is proposing that Capitalism, kind of the nature of our economy, has been transformed over the past decade or two in ways that are really troubling and that um, uh, deserve our attention. And at the end of the day, it's not, uh, you know, pro or counter technology. So the real question on the table is, what is the deeper intention based on which we develop, deploy, and use technologies? whether that's serving the well-being of just very few kind of, and you know, have uh, disabling impacts on human creativity and well-being, or, um, you know, whether that is focusing on the well-being of all. Number five, management. One-third, you know, there's like a bunch of studies out there, as you know, but one-third roughly kind of engaged, two-thirds disengaged, which, of course, is the declaration of bankruptcy, right, of the old management model, right, the hierarchical management model. The question is, how do we do this? Uh, ecosystem leadership, obviously, a lot more easy said than done. Uh, but, for example, you know, here at MIT, you know, we, you know, we, we are noticing there are really two different groups of students, right? So those who want to make the traditional career maybe more into these types of entities and then a different type of students who is really here for making the world a better place, kind of with a much higher level of social awareness and uh, intention to make an impact not later but now. And I think that's a very relevant force when we think, you know, those of us who work in organizations, who shape organizations, we need to get ready for that generation and kind of for that through the current moment, I can't breathe, uh, will, you know, has reached a tipping point and, you know, has, has really, um, is going to have a lot more influence uh, moving forward. So number six, consumption and post-growth. So now we come to the consumption side of the equation. So far, you saw the, the production function, as you noticed. GDP to GNH or well-being for all. Uh, as you all know, that has been a main topic uh, you know, uh, in the economy, at the OECD, and many other institutions. We know that GDP right, is not a good measurement for economic progress. In fact, more GDP does not mean more well-being. Uh, we know that. So that's... Uh, you know, poses the question, what are new indicators that really could track kind of the well-being for all? 
Um, and so that's, you know, a whole other uh, realm of um, conversation, another acupuncture point kind of that is uh, being addressed and that needs to be brought into the conversation. And the last one is uh, coordination and governance from hierarchy, competition, and organize, organized interest groups to something that I call awareness-based collective action. So hierarchy, right, the, uh, the, the visible hand, competition, the invisible hand, the organized interest groups, those are the mechanisms that we have now. What we are realizing is kind of they are not really, they are maybe necessary but not sufficient to help our economy to transform. And in almost all cases of profound challenges that we face, kind of from the Paris Agreement, you know, until the realization of the 2030 agenda uh, or making the circular economy really work, we need ecosystems of players coming together and develop like, uh, you know, apply systems thinking and, and, you know, develop a deeper understanding what's broken with our current systems and then addressing them through practical experimentation. That's what we mean with awareness-based uh, collective action, that we you know, understand and address the deeper root issues. Uh, we see uh, an evolution how that can impact really the transition to a sustainable economy. One of the best examples I know is Save the Bees Petition Bavaria, right, where a handful of people, it's basically applying what you already do in Switzerland, which is direct democracy, to the issue of sustainability. And, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent of if you ask people, do you want to have an agriculture that's regenerative or one that is poisoning yourself, your family, um, the water and, you know, uh, the ecosystem? No one is going to vote for the latter one. And that's what happened in Bavaria. And that's one of the big leverage points in countries like Switzerland or, uh, you know, uh, continents like Europe where you generally have a situation where the population, the consciousness of the population around sustainability is much further developed than it tends to be the case among political decision makers when they're too much influenced by vested interest groups. Citizen assemblies, like a whole bunch of countries here, you see the most of them actually in uh, out of Europe. All right, so that's what I basically shared with you. New economic infrastructures, I talked about seven acupuncture points. They are all part of a larger transformation uh, that moves us from ego to eco kind of in that context, circular economy being a key piece of it. Let me end with just a quick remark on this one, because one thing we know, all the new structures here that we need here, the new governance structures, are worth nothing if we don't complement them with the new leadership and learning infrastructures that really help us to be more effective in activating co-creativity. This is my one slide that summarizes what's going on today in the world around learning and leadership. And I would say two things are going on. One is deepening the learning cycle from head-centric, technical, head and hand, learning by doing, so head hard in hand, transformational learning. So that's one shift. The, that's kind of the deepening towards whole person learning, right? Head hard in hand. The other one is who is learning? Is it just the individual, the team, the organization, or the entire ecosystem? Now, looking at the matrix, ask yourself, okay, where do all the resources go, right? all the francs and all the euros and all the dollars in this matrix. And they all end up here in the bottom left, obviously, right? Individual learning and mostly technical, maybe sometimes learning by doing. A little bit of team, but not more. And talking about the future, talking about the big challenges, the big transformation challenges that we are just at the beginning of, what do we need? We need the top right and we need the entire matrix. So the blind spot is transformational ecosystem learning. It's kind of this upper right. And that's where we need new enabling infrastructures. So 
we at the you know presencing institute and kind of the Gaia journey was mentioned those are prototypes we see this kind of uh, our work and you know the uh, and it's really a whole movement that's organizing around that the following way the planetary healing and civilizational renewal okay that's what we try to um, be in service of that's what we try to support to make happen that's what we need to make happen in this decade as we know this to be successful here requires the activation of gen generative social fields, the activation of co-creativity on the level of ecosystems, okay? And in order for that to happen, we need a support infrastructure, right, that allows us to democratize the access to transformation literacy. Because that's what often is missing. So what we are working towards is, is, is this, right? As a vision and intention is creating something like this, Youth School for Transformation, that is democratizing access to transformation literacy. And um, that's basically what, what I wanted to share with you, is that these, um, you know, these innovations and infrastructures here go together with, you know, uh, innovations in learning and leadership infrastructures because uh, the structural change needs to be complemented with a cultural and a leadership change. And I think that's what we're here to pulling off together. Enta? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Otto, for uh, your input. Um, now, everyone, as you know, uh, there is a Slido link. It's posted in the chat. Um, so you can ask your question there, and you can also vote up questions that you would like us to ask to Otto. Um, maybe now as a transition question, just before we get some more questions in. Um, so you spoke about the structural infrastructures that we need to develop as societies to get to where we need to get to, to create this more resilient, uh, just future that works for everyone. Um, and we're also here as individuals tonight, individuals in leadership, Rose, you spoke a lot about re leadership. So maybe a first question would be, what can we do as individuals to galvanize the transition to new economic, democratic, um, learning infrastructures, if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, um, one thing is, um, I mean, it always starts with, uh, with oneself, right? Becoming more aware of my own patterns of consumption, kind of, uh, uh, of, you know, not only what, uh, does uh, what I'm consuming, for example, food choices, what does it do for to me, to my body or the body of uh, my community, but also to the larger ecosystem, right? So which is the whole issue of regenerative agriculture. We live in a world of hyper-localization and hyper-regionalization, I think. And that has been um, accelerated by COVID. Um, so the whole localization of the economy uh, around, you know, agriculture, around other cycles uh, is a major force. So in many ways, we can say that, you know, the, the, the questions, uh, the answers to the challenges of globalization, many of them are, are local, right? But they also require, uh, I think that's like uh, on the personal side, I would say a second thing is um, link up because there's a global movement already happening. This is exactly what, what what you guys do, right? So to link up with others in your in your context, in your region, and also globally, um, you know that's why we do stuff like Gaia, right? So where um, the global it's it's an acronym for Global Activation of Intention and Action. Just you know, creating space where people can listen to each other on a deep level to then have these conversations where we reimagine where we are going. And I would, so that's like kind of the global connectivity, I would say. And then a third um, piece that, that I would mention for sure is um, everyone, no one can do this alone. No one can do this in a Zoom call, to also be clear about that. Um, we need to deepen our relationships. And that's most 
often most easily done in small groups. Find yourself a, a you know a, a group where you can you know help each other. So that could be in Gaia we call this uh, social solidarity circle. It doesn't matter how you call it, but kind of some circle. Usually it's four, five, six. Uh, you know maybe it's a few more or less, but something that can self-organize easily and where you have intentional conversations, where you help each other and where, you know, we help each other with holding each other kind of and listening to each other with our mind and heart wide open. I think that's in, in many ways uh, a real foundation for strength and for support in this very, um, very difficult time. And then the last thing I would say is, follow your heart right so in terms of your um uh, you know do your thing right so find out what that is and so where you feel and i i don't think we are in a time where we need to spell out what the day after tomorrow will look like right what we need when you deal with disruption what you need is two things one is that you want to have clarity about your intention, your general direction. That's why we need to have these bigger picture conversations, okay? And the other one is you need to have clarity about the very next step. And then when you take that next step, then you notice in your heart, and we know that through our heart, whether you're moving in the right direction or not. So there's an energetic response. And when the energy goes down for too long, you know you're not on the right way, right? And when the energy goes up, I don't know what happens after the day after tomorrow, but I know I'm moving in the right direction. And that's the only thing that counts. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a few more questions that came in. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there's a question that also ties into what you just talked about. Uh, what makes you think the mindset of the majority changes after COVID-19 or I can't breathe? Uh, if, and especially if you think about uh, incidences like also Fukushima or the Volkswagen emission scandal, which also left little impact. Uh, so yeah, if you could speak uh, to that a little bit. Yeah. So, well, Fukushima, interesting. I mean, the result was energy transition. Yes, maybe it didn't happen exactly the way we wanted, but um, uh, I take the point, right? So that maybe uh, the initial aspiration that maybe many had was not or is not yet fully realized. I, I take that point. Here's why I think it's different. Living in the United States, I mean, I have a very... Um, and it's, of course, uh, heightened, right, the experience because of the um, COVID-19 situation that plays out also, as you all know, kind of differently here. Um, I just personally feel, I mean, I just, you know, personally can feel, uh, can, I think everyone who saw these videos, right, can feel the unspeakable pain. And I feel that just like in COVID, right? It was a, you know, COVID-19 was suddenly our global attention zoomed in on one thing and we were able to bend the curve. And I think what happens now is the same thing just on that next deeper level which is institutional racism and my my own uh cap so my blindness of not seeing what's going on my own numbness of seeing stuff seeing structural inequality but not feeling it right so my lack of really act activating opening my heart and the third blind spot here is seeing something feeling it and yet doing nothing about it, right? Apathy. So I think these disablers, right? The not seeing, the not feeling, the not acting, they're just that much more clear now. So I, you know, you, what you see here in the US going on is, uh, you know, a broad coalition, right? You see kind of um, white young people in suburbs going to the streets every day 
um, you see really kind of a much broader and deeper response from society that no one uh, was able to expect um, uh, even uh, days ago. And when you are on the streets, when you feel the connection, it really feels like a, a more profound shift. That doesn't mean it's going one way or another. But what it does mean is that there is a real possibility to really rethink the deeper foundations, right? The deeper dimensions of the social contract based on which our societies are grounded. And there's a lot, uh, you know, broken here in this country, but it's not the only country, right? I mean, as you all know, the mechanisms of exclusions we have in different ways. In Europe, kind of the, um, uh, you know, the sometimes felt pity to the United States, right? It's only a delusion, right? Because, you know, Europe is enacting the same stuff vis-a-vis -vis Africa, right? So it's just not happening in the same country. It's happening on a different level. So I think wherever we are, we have these mechanisms. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, the day after tomorrow, this problem will be solved. But what I viscerally feel is that there is a whole new situation. And lots of people who are totally unpolitical, are taking to the streets right now, right here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We um, are coming to the closing part of, uh, of your intervention. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing your insights with you from like a research perspective, but also from a very personal perspective and reminding us of the importance of, well, reaching out to one another, joining hands and doing that from also the connection of, of the heart level. So thank you so much for reminding us of that, Otto, and for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, congratulations for putting this uh, uh, event together. And this is exactly the type of conversation we need to have now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So I'm passing the word over now to my colleague, uh, Lorraine, who will uh, lead us into the next part of this event. Thank you, Krista. Thank you also from my side, uh, Otto. I admit I was expecting something good from you, knowing you, uh, but I am really truly inspired by your words and also your deep understanding of humanity. Uh, so thank you. And in order to let these words think, uh, sink in us a little now, uh, we're going to do a very, very short break, actually a two minute break <laughs> in order for everyone to, to just let it sink. And we have a, a little, uh, collective visioning exercise for you during these two minutes, where we would like to invite you to think about or to reflect on uh, two questions. The first is, what is your role in the transition? So really try to think uh, on your personal or job leadership level, etc. And do you have a concrete wish for the post-corona world? Also there, it will help for the discussion afterwards uh, please put your thoughts into the chat. Try to stay as concrete as possible. Just one sentence, one keyword. Uh, don't hesitate also to share a personal initiative, a project, an idea, your contact if you want. Uh, and we will see each other back in actually one. Let's do it two minutes still. So at one past six here, uh, one past, yeah, 51 here in the room. Um, I'm looking forward to it and enjoy the break. See you.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I saw the chat already gained in substance. Don't hesitate to continue writing in your answers. Uh, we will actually put a document together afterwards and share it with you. Uh, so we are looking forward to go through all of your answers afterwards uh, together. Now, before we move on to the next exciting part of this event tonight, I'd like us to test something out together. So Daniel, our tech wizard, will put us in a gallery view again. So please turn on your cameras, dear participants, if you can. Uh, actually, we didn't tell you, we, we try to leave them closed uh, for the duration of the event in order to have a smooth experience, but now you're allowed to open them up again. And what we are going to try out now, so I can imagine you are seeing on the screen where you are, so try to spot yourselves. And we are going to try out to give a high five to our neighbors on the screen. So you have different neighbors. So we challenge you tonight to really give a high five to uh, your neighbors. And we'll try also to take another picture as uh, it has not been possible to have you, every, every one of you uh, for the last picture. So please try it out now. Uh, try to spot yourself and try to <laughs> make the high five with the person next to you. So it is quite moving. It is even more challenging, but I see some of you already managed. Great. Okay, try to freeze, smile, high five. Perfect. Great, thank you. So as I mentioned, please turn uh, your camera back up again for the experience of this journey. And uh, we are moving now to the second really, really exciting part of this event tonight. And I would like to introduce to you to a special person, Patricia Matzdorf, um, who will be moderating the discussion with our four panelists tonight. So please give her a very big virtual applause already. Uh, stage is your Patricia. <laughs> from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine, and a uh, warm, warm welcome from my side. My name is Patricia Matzdorf. I am Senior Partnership and Project Manager at WWF Switzerland in the Department for Innovation and Socioeconomic Change. It is my absolute pleasure to be your host tonight, particularly for this thought-provoking panel alongside Nora Busse, who will be from Impact Hub Bern, who will be helping me with the questions later tonight. So in this next session, we will be building on Otto Sharma's reflections, specifically on the steps necessary from, to transition from ego to ecosystems with a special focus on acupuncture, acupuncture point one in the transition from linear, the linear economy to the circular economy. And we've decided to try and do something a little bit different um, with this next panel. We've tried to structure the flow to echo the initial steps outlined in Otto's Theory U from the Presencing Institute um, that he presented just before this session. Um, so we really want to start off with a, a download, taking stock, you know, what do the current patterns of behavior in business, politics, and society at large look like? What are we seeing and sensing here across our different um, spectrums? And then we're going to go into a reflection mode. So really trying to identify patterns, trends, you know, what does it all mean? Finally, coming through to, uh, to visions, you know, what would we like to see in this post-corona future um, for business politics and society and what prototypes and innovations can help uh, these become a reality. So whilst this is uh, a panel and together with our speakers, we're looking, really looking forward to, you know, going on this third thought journey together, we would still like you to be part of the discussion. There will be a Q&A at the end of the panel and feel free to add your thoughts in the chat or in the Google document that was provided just before the brief break. So we have a stellar cast for you tonight. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing them, starting off with uh, Adèle Torrance. Um, she is a member of the Swiss Council of States and president of ODA Umwelt, a network of professionals in the environment and clean sector clean tech sector in Switzerland. She's also a member of the foundation board for Sana Durabilitas, and, uh, which is essentially a think tank for sustainable development where she focuses on the topic of circular economy. A philosopher by training, uh, but her main focus is really the promotion of the green economy and promoting sustainable development in the broadest sense. So big welcome to you. 
Next Thank up, you. We, yes, so great to have you. Um, next up, we have Ion Karagounis, who is uh, working also in the WWF Switzerland. He is lead for future economics and environmental issues. He has been working for WWF Switzerland for over eight years um, and is, has now recently initiated an internal think tank uh, or slash program on future trends um, in economics and environmental fields. So we're definitely looking forward to hearing his input. Hi. Welcome. Welcome, yes. Um, fantastic. And so next on the, the our panel, we have Marie-Claire Graf. She's engaged in various organizations for climate protection and sustainability across Switzerland. She is president of the Swiss Association of Students um, Organizations for Sustainability, VSN, uh, and also co-founder of the Swiss Students Sustainability Week, which is all across um, Switzerland. And the initiative is now growing, was launched in 2017, is now growing internationally. She is also Vice President for the Swiss, Swiss Youth for Climate and um, Focal Point for the UNFCCC. So, you know, she is definitely the voice of the young people uh, who will be dealing with all of our decisions of today. And last but not least, well, very welcome to Marie-Claire if she's Hello. there. Perfect. And last but not least, we have a uh, Sustainable business lecturer, expert and entrepreneur, Professor Nancy Bocken. She is a professor at Maastricht University's Sustainability Institute. Not only is she an expert, but she is also a co-founder um, of a circular startup called Homey, which provides long-lasting washing machines and dryers to customers. What's really innovative about her business is that, and what about her startup is essentially that customers pay to use the washing machines instead of owning them. So this is the famous pay-per-use model that is um, a part of the sharing economy branch of the circular economy. I'd like to also just add on that she is also principal investigator in a recently launched European Research Council funded project called Circular X, which focuses on experimentation with circular service business models. Welcome to you, Nancy. <laughs> well, great. So without further ado, I'd like to get started with this session and with the whole notion of taking stock. Where are we today? What is the status quo? How is Corona? affected these different realities and i'd love to actually start with you nancy as a founder of a circular startup how is the crisis affecting you yeah thank you uh, for letting me address the first question so um you already mentioned what type of organization it is so we're a startup uh, focusing on a pay-per-use business model so rather than selling a washing machine we provide it on a pay-per-use basis which means that on the one hand, we can offer a, a circular model, so the consumer doesn't uh, own the product, but has access to the product, but also they get it installed for free in their homes. So that means that they only uh, start paying when they use the washing machine and every service like repair, um, uh, ability to reuse and maintenance is included in the price. So that already uh, lifts, up, uh, lifts up a tip of, uh, of the answer basically, uh, because it's a service model and it's relatively cheap. It's for free when you install it. So um, because you don't have to go to a shop to buy it and it's uh, cheap, that's uh, why it's, it has actually gone well uh, despite the Corona crisis it's an online offering high service model and circular sustainable but also affordable so that basically also shows that uh, in a business uh, you can be sustainable but you also have to have another proposition with it like affordability or service and we notice that that is yeah quite appreciated at the moment that's wonderful so in in, in effect actually the corona crisis the fact that you've been able to offer uh, maybe a lower cost service is actually not done harm to your business but actually you've been uh, a booster in some sense <laughs> yes well of course we had um, um, being like an affordable proposition we did have some sufferings from students maybe moving mm -hmm. homes going even back to their parents but at the same time we also had people who of course in a, even in a crisis need to do the laundry and uh, use mm -hmm. other household appliances so a net effect is actually uh, quite positive and yeah Fantastic. That says a lot for uh, for the actual the opportunity around circular models, particularly also in crisis settings. Um, but you know, if any any 
a business operates within a certain framework, particularly a political one that that um, basically is the basis on which every business can be developed. And for that, I'd actually like to ask Adele Torrance, a champion of the circular economy in uh, the political sphere. Um, perhaps you can give a little bit of insight of how has the crisis affected your ability to promote um, circular economy and political frameworks? Um, and maybe perhaps give an insight to, you know, what, where does the Switzerland stand on this topic? Welcome, Adele. I think Adele, you are still muted. I don't know if someone is. Oh, sorry, you didn't hear me. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Welcome. So, nice to hear you and see you. Thank you. Um, so, and um, sorry. Uh, so, we have a very special situation here in Switzerland because I think we are one of the only uh, states in the world uh, which uh, has uh, experienced a, a political debate popular po political debate about circular economy because um, the, the Green Party made a popular initiative. It's uh, an instrument of uh, direct democracy here in Switzerland. And um, the whole population could vote uh, about integrating the um, principles of uh, circular economy in the constitution. So unfortunately, we didn't have a majority apart in the canton of Geneva, which is a very progressive canton in Switzerland. Uh, and in the French speaking part of the country, we had uh, really good, uh, a good results. But it, um, I think it was very good for the um, uh, knowledge and consciousness uh, degree in the population, because uh, people had to talk about this. Uh, there were much debates and it was really interesting. And um, yes, we had that uh, coronavirus crisis and I think there are risks and opportunities because um, we have seen in Switzerland and I think it's uh, the same in other countries that people have dis discovered new way of life uh, when uh, they were uh, um, at, uh, uh, at home. Uh, they discovered how to buy uh, some food uh, in the farm. So the proximity was very important. We discovered too that um, it's dangerous when you are very dependent uh, with the imports. And uh, that's a good thing for a uh, circular economy because uh, thanks circular economy, you can reuse uh, resources that are already uh, in your country, uh, in your city, uh, so you can fight uh, um, against waste. And I think it's better for the autonomy and uh, the independence in a country. So this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to, to, to discover um, the proximity economy, uh, good food, <laughs> cooking, <laughs> uh, simple life with family. I think those are opportunities. But if we have um, an economical crisis, it, I think it could be dangerous. My experience uh, here in Switzerland, I'm, I make, I'm in the political field. Um, uh, 20, 40, I've been in the political field for 20 years. And right. I could see that when you have an economical crisis, it's some, it can be dangerous for environmental politics because there's a prejudice uh, in the population and uh, in politics. And this prejudice says that um, environment is not good for economy. And it's really a prejudice because with circular economy, you can have uh, uh, more employment, you can have uh, uh, more value, uh, you can have new business models, innovation. So it's, I think, really think it's good for economy. But people that don't see that, uh, they can be afraid if uh, we have uh, a, an economical crisis. So we really have to fight for uh, making people understand that uh, the ecological transition of economy is an economical uh, opportunity and that you can really uh, get uh, more uh, more business with it and that it's the right time now to uh, make that transition. 
Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. The, the no, whole notion of the, the crisis becoming a, an economic crisis being also a, a risk for the environmental discussion and the promotion of environmental issues. But um, there is, I hope there, there is still hope and the fact that there, you know, we have a, a, a direct example of collective action that um, Otto Sharma had mentioned as a, a way to move circular economy and circular approaches um, advance them essentially. Perhaps staying on the um, kind of macro level on the economic perspective, I'd like to address question to Eon um, as the lead for future economics and also a member of uh, an, an environmental NGO. Um, how does a crisis affect your work and your, um, your vision of promoting environmental issues in the economic space? I think we have, have to kind of uh, go to two different levels. Maybe on one level of uh, WWF as an organization that is international uh, active. I think uh, our work is affected really very much, in, uh, very specifically in the countries of the South where we had to stop uh, with, a, with a lot of, of, of projects and we, we had kind of really breaking down our offices and so on. So they are affected very, very specifically and very deeply and we have to see how we can uh, bring that uh, to work again. Uh, this is the, the very specific uh, effects we, we have to see. Then I'd say in, a, in the countries which are affected, affected a little bit less, uh, I saw a very hectical uh, time uh, in discussing people all over Europe, also in the United States, and so, okay, what will happen in the, in the politics? Since you know, WWF is, is very active also towards uh, political frameworks, there are the ones that uh, kind of see the challenges, kind of as Adel uh, told us before, that uh, they think, oh, people do not want to hear anything anymore from... Uh, from climate crisis and things like that. And then we have the other ones who very, very, uh, they were very fast and said, now it's our time. Now we have to intervene. We have to intervene in the political process because now people are establishing re recovery packages and we have to see here that those recovery packages are going into the right direction. And so I see a little bit both, both sides. So if I'm looking back, let's say even one or two years, it was the first time for, for a very long time that we could discuss about systemic change. It's uh, thanks of the whole uh, climate movement of, of the youth, of the young generation that we are uh, at the sudden uh, able to talk about systemic change. Maybe people understand very, very different things about what a systemic change could be, but at least we, we could talk about it. Now, I'm not sure at present if it will be possible uh, uh, for this moment, because people, yeah, they are uh, in fear of what will happen, but I think it will come back. Reading already now newspapers in Switzerland, they are restarting discussion about climate crisis, telling us climate crisis won't stop even if we have corona crisis. So, yeah, I think it will, it will come back, this discussion, and will give us opportunities. Fantastic. No, I think that's a that's an important point. The the notion of being able to discuss this um, systemic change as a whole and 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 making that part of a just a broader context discussion with many different stakeholder groups. Perhaps um, I'd like to now just give also the word to Marie. Um, you work with young people, young people of today. Um, you, you these young people will be taking over the world once we're all gone. Um, how has the crisis affected your work as a youth climate activist or advocate? Yeah, um, of course, it was like a full stop in what we have been doing, protesting on Friday, but also going to national and international conferences. So it was a very abrupt stop. Um, nevertheless, after um, digesting the first shock, um, I think uh, young people made it quite well, especially also because we know how to use uh, modern technologies. We are very um, often anyway are working digitally to together um, because I'm like in some networks working all over the world. So um, as we cannot meet uh, physically, we are very used to to use Zoom and Google Drive and all these tools, right? Um, so I think this was working quite well, but what for me is the major point is that now we saw that it's possible to have this urgency and scale, what we are always pointing out when we are talking about the climate crisis, that this now is possible. So we, we really 
slip into this, this global existential crisis as the climate crisis is one as well. And suddenly the governments and also economy and, and the whole society could move together and showing solidarity and move to a rapid reaction. And this is really great to see. Of course, um, we already know that this must happen and that we can do this, but um, a lot of people uh, didn't believe that it's going to happen. And this is for me the biggest takeaway that actually makes me happy because this gives at least to me a lot of hope that yes, we can overcome the climate crisis and yes, we can um, really get together and be more stronger and stand in solidarity. Um, so of course it's a quite hard, hard time and it's very challenging, especially from um, people, from young people in under um, privileged uh, communities around the world who cannot afford to have the same protection as we have, for example, here in Switzerland. That's also why I recently co-founded a startup, which is actually very similar to Nancy, what you're doing, but with uh, protective masks. So basically um, decentralize and localize the protective mask um, production and enable people and communities and also hospitals to produce them themselves. So we contract the machines for free and they only pay, um, pay per piece. And honestly, it's so cheap to produce them. And all these fake masks, fake certificates and these insanely high prices make it, make it very, very challenging, especially for young people and, and, and also marginalized communities to yeah, be protected in this crisis. Um, so this crisis really gave us an opportunity to be innovative. And I really hope that we can take this along. And I really also hope that young people um, who are again out of the whole conversation um, are afterwards really taken into con consideration that we have a more intergenerational approach in economy, but also in politics, um, that we can harness the power of, of young people and the dynamic of young people and merge it with the experience of the of the generation um which already have been dealing with several crises uh i re the the notion i think that's you're already getting kind of to the vision you know where where would you like to get to the whole notion of innovation the intergenerational approaches um and perhaps that's that actually touches on the, the next kind of stage really looking at the opportunities that have emerged out of uh, this crisis and maybe i'd like to give the word to to nancy um you I have on one hand the startup perspective, but also um, as a sustainable, sustainable business expert. Um, what do you think the, you know, is circular economy a pathway, a feasible strategy for going forward? You know, what for other strategies could become more prominent after the post COVID? That's of course a, a big question, but I think yes, circular economy is here to stay, and I, and I see many projects being picked up that relate to circular economy economy potentially because it has like uh, yeah the potential to create new jobs, but also uh, lead to of course positive environmental impact and also new uh, economic opportunities. Uh, what I've seen is in terms of uh, business responses is that it really touches up upon the yeah opportunities that other speakers already had, like uh, bringing it and making it more local again, um, also local value creation, whether it's the masks or involving people on in other uh, activities. So two of the examples uh, that I saw on new circular approaches were related to both the fashion industry, but also travel. Um, when you think about tourism, uh, it will be more local, but you can also think about benefits to the communities any, uh, again. Think about cities like Venice and Amsterdam, which were swamped with tourists. How can you create a positive experience more locally so that also the local people benefit from tourism? So that could be more like a, a local approach. So that is one example. In terms of fashion, it's maybe a, quite a different example, maybe not localism, but more uh, something that I call sufficiency and slowing consumption. Uh, what you can see there is even uh, companies like Gucci saying, why do we do seasonal fashion shows and why don't we focus more on more permanent collections? So there was also an open letter to the fashion industry that was uh, being signed uh, May this year, like only a few weeks ago. Uh, and one of the key things that was said uh, in there was we should create less unnecessary products. And this is quite radical, of, of course, to say of a profit making uh, business. Uh, another thing uh, was in a webinar with um, a Patagonia outdoor company, and they were also talking about the right size of the business post Corona. So I think a lot of businesses, even like the big um, 
quite well um, well off companies are thinking about what should be our future, whether it's travel, whether it's clothing, what should be the right size of our business. And that very much fits into the circular economy discussion, like what should we be doing next, more local, right side of the size of the business. Actually, anti-consumer is not just selling any stuff, but stuff that lasts. And uh, yeah, things like that really fit uh, in both uh, yeah, post-COVID, but also circular economy, definitely. I think those are two very inspiring examples, given um, their significant ecological impact on the, the world. I mean, the fashion industry with their fast fashion trends and, and tourism and that mobility, um, the mobility footprint, which I think make up about 20% to CO2. So um, actually, you'd also pointed about, you just mentioned discussion points, you know, how is that going to change our, our discussion of the of the, the ecological um, or environmental impacts? And I think actually for this, I'd like to hand the word to Eon. Um, you know, you, were, you also mentioned a couple of points about opportunities. And yeah, I think you were also, you also said you had sort of something about the communication, like how should we be, be communicating post-COVID if we would like to make a more sustainable future a reality i think it's one one of the most crucial thing for me it's about communication that, that's why i also like to disagree a little bit i disagree with what uh, mari said uh, before about uh, she said yeah now it's possible we see uh, it's possible to act uh, during corona crisis so why do we uh, now it's uh, it's proven that we can act for to to face a, a climate crisis here I'm a little bit more maybe too old for that or realistic in a certain way that I think most of people, they, they do not want kind to, to hear the same thing that they heard now, the, what they heard the, the last two or three months. Because for many, many people, it just have been many restrictions during these two or three months. And so we, we can't come and, and say, Let, ha, let's have a look. Uh, it worked. We, we, we could act. We should act in the same with, uh, way with the climate crisis. I think here we have to find other ways. I do not know yet what these ways are. It's maybe more uh, to be really take a very realistic steps and maybe small steps, as you mentioned it before. Okay, we've seen other ways of consuming things. We've seen, okay, it's also okay with uh, uh, buying uh, one shirt less things like that or uh, let's uh, uh, let's talk about home office you see it worked with home office uh, let's talk about mobility okay we see it worked without uh, uh, traveling every day from home to Zurich and so on I think on this level we can communicate but I don't think that people are interested in in, in hearing things like oh now you see we can change everything immediately I, I don't think that this will work it's fine and good and important that we think that way, but for a majority of people, we, we have to communicate in another way. I think that's an important point to make. I'd like to just maybe just open the floor to, to uh, Marie in, in case there is something that you, um, and maybe you have a, uh, a reflection upon Ion's point on communication. Yeah, actually, I think you have to see it from the other way around, uh, so that we don't want to get into another global crisis and an existential crisis again. And there are several of them waiting. So one is a biodiversity crisis, there's a climate crisis, and there are several other crises waiting for us. So we shouldn't say that, oh, okay, let's go all back home and, and, and make a lockdown and then climate is fine, because climate is not going just to be fine because we are sitting at home while a lot of the economies are actually still producing. And in the beginning, like the flights were still running and a lot of things are still going on. So we need, as also Otto mentioned in the beginning, we need like to get very deep and then growing out of it and then change the thing. So not saying that we need to get to lockdown, but say we want to prevent another lockdown, which is actually even worse. Um, and also what we mentioned that the number one solution is, is the agriculture system. Um, we don't want to get into a food crisis and, and all this crisis, which could come. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do think that it's, it's always easier and it, it, it's easier to um, change a system which somehow got a full stop in instead of changing a running system. And now we have this unfortunate, fortunate situation of having such a full stop. And if we are not using it, um, I and a lot of young people will be very mad. <laughs> And in the words of Winston Churchill, never waste a good crisis. Um, perhaps on this point, I'd like to also give the word to Adele Torrance. Um, you spoke a lot also about the opportunities um, 
that are that evolve with this crisis perhaps also from your perspective in the political space well, how do you think we could come we could make the next step you're on mute just you might need to unmute yourself first first the next step is really now because uh, we are discussing uh, we had a discussion today in the parliament about climate because we are uh, working on the CO2 law. So that's the next step for us. And uh, it's a little bit a test because um, we see now uh, if something has changed uh, with our colleagues uh, because there were lot, lots, uh, lots of words about positive words uh, from politicians about climate. And um, we have to say, see now uh, if those words uh, have um, consequences, positive consequences and concrete uh, consequences. And then for circular economy itself, we have some good news too. Uh, because uh, when we made that um, that uh, popular initiative, the um, federal council had made a proposal uh, from itself um, with uh, some measures uh, which went not so they, they were not so um, important as our initiative, but they were good me measures. And then the the old parliament um, uh, refused it, and now we have tried with some colleagues to. Uh, make the same proposal with the new parliament because you know our parliament mm. here in Switzerland they are much much more a green um, a person than in the the old one and we made really the same proposal uh, then uh, were refused from the old one and um, we we hope that this time it will work so there are proposals uh, about um, valorizing waste, uh, fighting uh, against waste, because we have really an industry of waste uh, now in Switzerland and in other country. And uh, we have to make laws that promote reusing things and not uh, wasting things. Uh, 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 we have to promote laws that uh, um, make uh, repairing things uh, uh, less expensive le than uh, uh, buying new uh, new products. So we have made so, some of uh, such proposals and um, they were treated in the um, Environmental Commission of the National State uh, uh, Council and um, we had a good result. So we, have a, we had a majority. So I think we are in a, in a good way. Uh, the crisis of coronavirus uh, is here, but I don't think that it will change everything because the problems are still here. We are still in the climate crisis. People see it because uh, it's uh, it's very warm. And um, I think that uh, the problem with natural resources and waste, uh, it still exists and people know it. So I'm, yeah, I'm relatively optimistic. And I think we, we will have results. Uh, the, um, the parliament here in Switzerland is now very progressist. We never had so much chance to to uh, to get results, and um, we would see. But it's it's time for a change, and I think that change will come uh, with coronavirus uh, too. Fantastic, and I think uh, that's a very optimistic um, point and, and and perspective. To actually, I'd like to also open up uh, the discussion also to further questions from the audience. And I believe Nora um, has some of these lined up. Nora? Yes, I'm here. Um, you cannot see me yet. <laughs> I'm <laughs> here at the background. So, yes, uh, we got several questions. Um, maybe the top question at the moment, because the, the audience can vote on the questions, would be for Adele. Uh, it's about um, the decision that was made to help Swiss airlines. Yeah. Uh, so the Swiss government decided to help the Swiss airlines without, uh, actually it's called Swiss today, uh, without any environmental requirements. So is this a wrong signal? Uh, is Switzerland too protective of its economy? What is your take on this? Yes, so... It was really, really difficult. And for us, it, 
yeah, it, we were really, really angry because we tried to uh, have conditions because other countries did this, uh, France, uh, Germany, Austria. So we were really the only one who, who told those companies, we give you money and you can do anything yeah, to, to go back to the old world. And yes, it was very difficult and we, we couldn't get a, a majority and we were really, really frustrated. And um, we tried to see if we could have a um, referendum. It's a um, popular uh, decision about a law. When you're not happy with the law, you can get signatures and uh, then uh, have a vote. But it was the um, emergency, an emergency law, emergency decision, and we couldn't do it. So it was really, uh, we couldn't be more frustrated. So. I think um, our hope is now uh, that uh, we can get a tax about um, uh, the um, aviation tickets, the tickets, flight, flight tickets. Uh, and I think that could be a success. It will be uh, discussed tomorrow. Uh, so um, it's, it's really now. And I think about such uh, a tax, we have a chance, but... Uh, Sustaining those companies without condition, it was, it's really a pity and I'm sorry we couldn't manage to, to get better, but yeah, it was very frustrating and shocking. Thank I think, you. Yeah, please. Yeah, there are quite a few more questions uh, if we still have time. Yes. So uh, there would be one for Nancy. Uh, it's about the right sizing, so um, the audience picked up that if we do the right sizing of the businesses, this would obviously also mean uh, that people are losing their jobs, a lot of people. So how can the local businesses make up for this? Yeah, I think that's a, a typical question, typical circular economy question, typical question about slowing consumption, but I'm... Uh, yeah, do believe that other types of jobs can be created when you see large businesses now experimenting with new approaches. What they do is often work with local businesses, even like huge multinationals working, for instance, on repair networks. Um, yeah, helping people like uh, upskill their products again. So I see that there are many new jobs could be uh, created. And then um, you could also make value out of the same product multiple times, like uh, whether it's a washing machine or um, a clothing item, uh, whatnot. So I see that there could be many different jobs that have not been supported in the past that need to be revived again. And that links to, I have the questions open as well, one on what uh, could I do <laughs> if I had the chance to, to change things post COVID. I hope that there was, uh, yeah, what I've seen um, in terms of innovativeness and resilience of people People, of individuals I hope that uh, can be strengthened uh, also in the future this um, yeah resilient approach innovative approach as a response to something like COVID and I hope that we can act as quickly as possible on the climate crisis as well whether it's through something we call circular economy or sustainable response whatever we would call it I think we need to treat the crisis uh, with the same immediate uh, immediacy that we've done uh, with COVID and we've shown that it's, that is possible Thank you, um, Nancy. I think those are some those are perspectives definitely to, to take with us. Um, Nora, do you have any more questions that are coming from the audience? Yes, I think one interesting uh, one is also um, how to include the youth better into the dialogue about circular economy. Maybe we could start. Uh, this was addressed to everyone, but maybe Mary Claire, you could start with a short opening on this, uh, how to include youth better into the dialogue around circular economy. Yeah, absolutely. So as um, already mentioned by Otto, there are different levels. So um, only including young people, for example, in accelerators and innovation um, booth camps is, is great, but it's not enough. We also have to include them in the, po in the policy making. 
uh, because the policy making is also giving a framework um, what is possible and if young people and especially their ideas and their needs are not reflected in the current system and as we know especially in Switzerland it takes pretty long until it's actually going to be implemented so if the if the, the values and the views of young people are not in the political framework it's also very challenging for um, example passing passing a, a laws accordingly and and also what um, was mentioning uh, what Otto was mentioning on on the on the learning on the whole education sector as well there we have to incorporate already very early that young people are empowered to come up with ideas themselves um, I don't know how it was for you but I, I'm studying a bachelor's now at the University of Zurich before at ETH and and going through the whole education system it was not an empowering experience for me. It was what Otto was mentioning on, 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 the, um, on the educational uh, graph. And it was about an individual learning from, from a frontal learning perspective. And I dare think we have so much more to do on all different levels. And this is only possible if we really give the space with a mandate um, to young people that they can be part of the structure and also have a veto or have a, a decision making. It's, it's no longer enough to have young people as a um, a site structure and having it nice on the social media or having it nice on the website, but we, ne we need to give them the needed power to change the system itself and hence give, have to give them a decision-making mandate. I love the idea of giving young people a decision-making mandate in politics. I think that, that I would be very interested to see what the result of that is. I mean, Adele, yeah. would you want to jump yeah. in on that? Yeah, uh, I could say something about this. We tried to uh, have the, the vote at 16 years old in Switzerland because uh, it was uh, already a discussion in some cantons. And um, it's uh, an issue uh, now at the federal level. And it would be nice to allow such young people to uh, take part in the decisions. And I think it's uh, a first measure. But we have uh, to to promote the the act acting uh, uh, the vote because people has the right to vote um, uh, already at eighteen. But the young people uh, don't vote uh, so much. Uh, old people vote, <laughs> but young people don't vote so much, and that's really a problem. We we must convince young people to participate here in Switzerland. We are very lucky. We have so much possibilities to uh, take part to the decisions with the, those uh, uh, popular initiatives, uh, referendums uh, and elections every four years. You can change um, the whole parliament and you can put who you want here. You can uh, also put young people. Um, I'm not so young, but we have much young people now in the, the Swiss parliament. Uh, much more green, but also much more women and much more young people. And it's really necessary because you don't see life in the same way uh, when you are 20 years old or 60 years old. It's really not the same world. Yeah, I come in. I, I would even uh, propose uh, another thing, no, not only the right to vote uh, with 16, but also uh, to say that we have to have a, a limit for for uh, kind of people that are in parliament. So we say, I don't know, maybe 12 years or uh, not more than 16 years, no, rather 12, 8 to 12 years that people cannot stay longer than. So we have more change. And I think this gives uh, more chances also for young people to go into the parliament. What a revolutionary thought! I like, uh, you know, to, the whole notion of change, the whole notion of getting young blood in uh, to the the decision making structures of this country. I think are are one wants to be taken seriously. Um, perhaps there's still once a couple more questions, the space for a couple more questions. Nora, do you have a few more? Yes, um, actually, uh, there are so many interesting questions <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, like, <laughs> what should we take next? Because we don't have much time left. But I think uh, somebody posted a very interesting input. Um, they state that we need a global climate crisis with global impacts because the majority doesn't feel the need to change environmental consumer behavior based on a health crisis. What are your thoughts on this? Any input, anybody to, who wants to jump in on this? 
I mean, really, yeah. that we would need a larger crisis uh, that people would be ready for change. I mean, we are already in a climate crisis. People are already dying, and we are just not seeing the news here in our news. But we know that there is land um, which is already underwater. We know uh, that there are droughts. So the climate crisis is already here and is, is affecting um, more lives, and especially also um, animal and species um, around the globe. So. It is here and most people know it. Um, we just decided yet not to act. Perhaps a point to the, to the apathy that uh, Otto Sharma was mentioning that the whole notion of being aware but not actually necessarily acting on it yet. Yeah, which is also due, I think, to a certain extent to the fact that the people that are in power, that they, they are not affected enough yet. So. I think it's important to see too that uh, you you have to experience the crisis and we actually experience it, but you have to see uh, that solutions exist. I think it's very important because if you uh, experience the crisis and you, you don't see any solution, you will uh, despair or trying not to see anything and refuse to see anything and I think um, uh, um, we have to, to try to, to make understand people that uh, the solution exists. And um, as a politician, I think that uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the public field has to uh, promote those solutions, show people that they exist and make uh, those solutions uh, affordable and uh, uh, um, Yes, people have to, to take those solutions and to, to experience them. And I think you, we, we have to, uh, to have a mix of experiencing crisis, but also giving hope. Because if you, will, you don't have hope, if you don't have a solution, you won't do anything. I think that's a really great segue to actually, um, I think maybe the, the parting thoughts or final takeaways and perhaps closing the loop on the, the theory you, um, that final step really is about visioning and prototyping and maybe that can be linked to the notion of solutions. So if we could, let's say, prototype or offer some solutions for the people on this call today, but also um, for our post, for to shape our post-corona reality, what um, final thought, innovation, prototype, would you like to give um, the audience here today? And I'll, I'll, I'll be asking each of the, the panelists, so whoever wants to start, please. I might, yeah, Nancy, please jump in. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so you mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, like my research, uh, recent research project is called Circular X, and that's really about experimentation with new approaches. It's more based on a business approach, but I think it very much applies to personal lives again. So basically, um, what I think is that you can think about what can I start today or what can I start tomorrow, basically, but also thinking big, but also starting small, like making it something that you could do uh, tomorrow, whether it's something in your own consumption patterns, like uh, uh, eating less meat uh, and things like that, or uh, reducing how much water you use, um, or helping others um, um, do the things that, that they want to achieve, like participating in the, in the climate um, uh, Fridays for the future, for, for instance. Think about what you can do tomorrow to contribute. And again, uh, think big, but start small, because if you only think big and worry, uh, then you will never start. So I think that is, uh, that is what I would suggest, like make it small, make it something personal and see what you can do yourself. And it doesn't have to be huge to start with, but you have to start somewhere. I couldn't agree more and it's very catchy and easy thing to remember, think big, but start small. So um, yeah. thank you, Nancy. Would anybody who would be next to give their part, their final thoughts? Perhaps Marie-Claire, I'll just call on somebody. Yeah, um, I think it's really about empowering uh, your community. Um, if we, if we, if we um, think big and start small, but honestly, the time is not allowing us to, to think about one shirt less or more, about one burger less or more, but we really have to upscale it because there are limits and the limits are coming from our planet and we can't decide on it. Um, so even if you make these incremental changes, 
um, this is not going to help ultimately at the end. So if we are empowering um, everyone we know in our network, and now we have also the time because we are coming somehow closer together, this crisis is forcing us um, to communicate and be closer together. So let's use this, um, this, this crisis and, and the solidarity we are feeling and seeing now um, to empower everyone um, yeah, to, to make the really, really big changes happen because otherwise um, it's probably not going to work. Yes, I mean, the, we know we're drawing ever closer to the tipping points and um, with our 2030 horizon looming, um, I think definitely the need for scaling is there. So thank you for that, Marie-Claire. Um, Ion. I think, uh, I hope, or I see even already the tendency that people start to think about uh, who are we and what government do we have and, and what system uh, are we in. We have seen many different ways how, how different countries have been handling the crisis. We had the Asian way, very strict. We had the European way, maybe a little bit less strict. And then we have what I would say we have the way of populist governments, populist countries, and I think they completely failed in in uh, kind of fight the crisis and my hope is that people really do recognize that uh, it's not a way populism is not a way how we can face problems uh, the big problems of our future but that we really have to cooperate that we have to go more into depth more into details to to solve uh, our big challenges Absolutely, in the system there, you know, we, they say if you pull at one string of nature, the rest of nature comes tumbling right along. We are all interconnected in the system. And so the notion of cooperation and collaboration is essential to, to make uh, this systemic change. So thank you for that, Ian. Um, and last but not least, Adele, do you have any last um, thoughts or things of prototyping solutions you want to give um, to the audience? <laughs> yes, perhaps um, uh, my hope for us. Uh, special issue you you know that europe has a um, strategy strategy for plastics and uh it, it's a very important issue because plastic is really the best example of uh, uh one use material waste material uh on, and um in switzerland i i asked the the federal council to have a, a strategy too and uh, the administration is working on it so I had a majority uh, on that issue. Uh, I was very astonished because it was uh, with the, the old parliament. And I think that if we can um, choose some really materials, very important materials, and try a circular solution for that uh, materials, uh, it's really uh, a good example. And then you can take another another material for example the fashion uh and um uh le tissu how do you say mm -hmm. it in english textiles textiles thank yeah. you oh, textiles it's uh, also some material where we have a, a huge problem of uh, waste and pollution and we can begin with one we try solution and then we take another one and step by step, uh, we can manage this. And I, I'm looking forward to uh, this, uh, this plastic strategy in Switzerland because we are waiting for uh, uh, the study and the proposals of the Federal Council. And I think it's very important to begin with plastic because plastic is, is fossil too. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the same problem that uh, we have with climate and we have to manage the whole problem. Thank you very much, Adele. And I think that's a, that's a, you know, I like the approach of saying we're starting with one innovation at a time and really trying to do a resource based approach with saying, okay, we have lighthouse projects, good examples to carry us forward and give us those, po that positive, um, that positivity to say that we can make a change. So thank you. Thank you very much to you and to all of the panelists. It's been such a thought provoking and inspiring journey. Thank you. And, with now those parting thoughts, those final takeaways to give to our audience, I'd like to also hand over to Lorraine, who will be um, guiding us through the next part of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Puncto on Time 46. Thank you so much, Patricia, for the great moderation uh, of this panel. And thank you also from my side, uh, dear panelists, for this very insightful 
useful and activating inputs uh, from all of you. So I would have loved actually to be in a room with all of you. You would have seen doing me this sign, the silent <laughs> agreement sign initiated by Climate Strike. So what I retain really is that now is the moment and I really hope that we can pull together uh, all together in order to make your visions become a near reality. Thank you very, very much. So before we officially close this event tonight, uh, I have a last special guest for you to share with us some concrete recommendations that are in the making, so fresh from the oven, so to say, um, for you tonight. <laughs> so I would like to introduce Holger Schmidt, director of the Sustainable Economy Program at the MAVA Foundation, a foundation that has already been uh, or done a lot for the circular economy transition worldwide. So Holger is also a co-initiator of the National Swiss Circular Economy Movement and founding member of the European Donor Collaboration on Circular Economy. So I am really glad to give you the word, uh, Holger. Can you hear us? I think you're still muted. Can... Yeah, that happens all the time. Thank Perfect. you, Lauren. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I wanted to start by just uh, saying that and reminding us at the beginning of the meeting, even before everyone joined, we sat together as the speakers. And I said, let's try to make that an engaging and, and, and different event tonight. And I would like to uh, thank you for having mastered to put on something that's colorful, that's engaging, that's interactive and uh, memorable. So, and personally, I, I, I do remember I just that the words at the very beginning I thought were very thought provoking and more and might stay for us for a long time. So you cannot change systems unless you change your consciousness. I don't know if that's just something we all might need to think about a little bit longer. And, and I also like very much coming together in social circles of solidarity. And with that, I just wanted to remind us that we are already living the circular economy tonight, I think in events like these, we call it in, in this virtual webinar or in, in, in virtual collaborations and workshops that we have all managed to pull off over the last couple of weeks. And you, Laurent, there just said, wouldn't it have, it would be so nice to be together with you physically in one room. I would like to say, no, I don't. Let's stay virtual. The, the thing, what we just managed to do is just be largely dematerialized and we decarbonized social interaction and, and collaboration and even knowledge creation, I would say. And we not only decarbonized it and dematerialized it, we also accelerated it amazingly. Today or, or over the last weeks, we have seen that we can create knowledge within two weeks. We can pull together people from around the world with very little notice time, have them talk together for two hours, not only talk, but actually create knowledge because we learn to collaborative, collaborate virtually. And this pr probably could be the, the biggest impact out of the crisis because we can accelerate our community and grow our circle and learn as an ecosystem as it was proposed by Otto. And I think that's maybe already the living circular economy somehow. And, and that's the starting point of a journey and we have to hold on to it and not let it go. Um, and then I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm here as representing the circular economy Switzerland movement as I was, it was introduced. And I just wanted to say quickly, this event was put on by circular economy transition and by the impact hub. And that's a fabulous movement bringing together lots of exciting and engaged people. The circular economy Switzerland is yet a larger group of people in, within that sit circular economy transition. And that, that group, or it's not a group, it's actually a movement. And by being a movement, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to participate, to join, to collaborate. And, and this movement obviously also has come together and think about the, the circular economy and the crisis and what should be done and has put out a few recommendations for action. And that's what you were uh, alluding to, Lauren. And I do not want to 
list them all one after one, but certainly there are three big packages where action is needed. And one is certainly in the political space. And Laurent has already uh, pointed at some of the discussions currently ongoing, but it's certainly terribly important that uh, politics and, and polit political decision makers finally start creating the framework that allows us to reduce our dependency from international dependency and importing resources, make our supply chains more resilient and create uh, incentives and disincentives for reduced material consumption. And the other package obviously is uh, our administration. Our administration has to become concrete. These are the people taking the political leadership and taking it and turning it into action. And here we need concrete development of plans, be on, on a city level, commune level. How do you, for example, procure circular economy products? And you cannot procure them because they are not existing. So you need to procure innovation. How do we can how do we motivate and we need to motivate our administration to become innovators? innovators through procurement and that's what they should become and then obviously we do have the whole private sector and the private sector has to take a leap of faith at the moment in a time of crisis where they struggle to survive but falling back into the old system is not their survival strategy it's taking the risk and think new products new design craft the opportunity and we would like as a movement, and maybe all together here on the call can join in and support these people who have these leading ideas to become successful entrepreneurs. With that, and you can all obviously read about these recommendations in more detail on the website of the Circular Economy Switzerland movement, and I invite you to do so. And with that, thank you very much again for this exciting evening tonight, two hours worthwhile spent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Holger, for your inspirational words and for your valuable inputs outlining the concrete challenges we have and the concrete steps that need to be taken. Thank you very, very much. So now we come to the final words. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank already our great partners and allies in this whole, uh, making this whole work and all these incredible synergies possible. Thank you also to our great speakers and panelists tonight for the clear inputs and reflections you shared. Thank you to our moderators, Krista, Patricia, and Nora. Uh, thank you to the team behind and all the helping hands, the tech supports, Daniel, the communication, Victor, and our precious network in this journey. And of course, thank you to you, uh, dear public, joining us from all around the world uh, tonight. And we hope you got inspired by this discussion and these reflection points. Thank you in advance for shaping the post-corona world with your projects, ideas, everyday life choices, and your career, your city. So I'd suggest we turn on our cameras one last time and try to capture the energy, uh, the motivation, and the envy that is in this room. So, because I think this is what our world needs most right now. So I see the cameras turning on, super. Please don't hesitate, give us a smile. Uh, you can give us a heart also if you want this needs, the world needs that too. And we're taking a last picture all together of this night. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. And to close this event, uh, I'd like to share one last phrase with you. Uh, it is a poem actually by Leslie Dwight, and it resonated a lot with me when I was observing all happenings and even important decisions uh, being cancelled or postponed this year. And I'd like to read this to you before you can go out to your dinners or uh, evenings. And it goes like this. What if 2020 isn't cancelled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awaking us from ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare change, change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally bend together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather the most important year of them all. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone, and keep working for a just and sustainable world. 
All the best and goodbye.